I've done a lot with AI recently, and I wanted to return to my first love, which is writing nicely. So um, you may know that um, for a long time I did what they call deliberate practice. Or in the old days, they used to call it having a, um, a, a commonplace book whereby you took writing, or anything really, but writing in, in our case probably, of, of people you admired, and you wrote it out by hand. And so for a number of years, I used to, every morning, I, I have had a little bit of lapse recently, I used to write it out. And of course, you would tend to write out those people whose writing was well admired. And one of these, of course, is Virginia Woolf. So I've taken a selection from her book, The Years, the beginning of her book, The Years, to look at how she creates the effect of admired and beautiful sentences. Okay, I'm going to read it first, and then we'll have a look at it. So you can hear how beautiful it is, first of all. Or not, you may think it isn't, but I kind of think it is. So, it was an uncertain spring. The weather, perpetually changing, sent clouds of blue and purple flying over the land. In the country, farmers looking at the fields were apprehensive. In London, umbrellas were opened and then shut by people looking up at the sky. But in April, such weather was to be expected. Thousands of shop assistants made that remark as they handed neat parcels to ladies in flounced dresses standing on the other side of the counter at Whiteley's and the Army and Navy stores. Interminable processions of shoppers in the West End, of businessmen in the East, paraded the pavements like caravans perpetually marching. So it seemed to those who had any reason to pause, say, to post a letter or at a club window in Piccadilly. I'm not going to read the rest. I'm going to look at, look at the text. So basically, um, I ask, I summarised what it was saying. Uh, and in the longer term, this is what Chachi Piti thought. Uh, the passage describes the unpredictable weather of spring in London, with farmers and city goers alike feeling uncertain. Despite this, the season brings a bustling atmosphere to the city with shoppers, carriages and musicians filling the streets. I didn't get any musicians. As evening approaches, well, they give the whole thing, so... But you can, you can actually boil that down to even less. The weather in England in spring is uncertain. But even so, people do go out. So that's what she's saying, more or less. Um, so, but she's not just doing that. So why write all that just to put that point of view? Well, of course, she's not just giving you a report. She's entertaining you in a piece of prose and fiction. So the thing, one of the things she's doing is drawing you in uh, and... It's using a rhetorical device called Enagia, which uses sensory description. And it's only um, really visual. There's no smell, there's no sound in that one. And you may have been encouraged in your creative writing classes to use both of those. And I think they do work. But Virginia chooses not to. So, But she uses sensory description. She's showing you what's happening to provoke perceptual responses in readers and listeners as if they were there. So the one weird thing about human beings is when we get a stimulus of, say, we go to the movies and we see a war film and we get all riled up or we see a love film and we feel, oh, or we see a horror film and we're like, ah, you know, and these things aren't really happening. But the, the uh, simulation, the simulation of the sensory inputs, so we don't really see Dracula. Uh, but we we it's as if we do, and we get all those emotions, and we you know um, there we are. So and this is how art works, really. So um, so now through Virginia Woolf's writing, you are wherever you are, you, you were you when you listened to that, you were partly in London in spring at the beginning of the twentieth century, probably about nineteen twenties, and not only that, as I say, you're now upper middle class if you weren't before. But the other thing that she's doing, as well as the uh, drawing in with the description is through music. So we know that music is patterns of sound made of different notes, rhythms, and repetitions of the same patterns of sound. You know, da 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 da. I keep using this one, but da 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 da. Let me go again. Da 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 da. So you repeat the slight variations in music, and and the the length, the rhythm, the also the the percussion and uh, the actual tones as well, which sounds we're using. And we can actually equate those to writing because we have the rhythm of the sentences. We have the sounds, the notes are like the s, b, d, k. You know, we repeat those and uh, we can do those. And remember how music, even without words, can take us away to far off places. So she's doing that. She's using the music of her sentences as well as 
the uh, visual imagery of her sentences and by both of those things she's transporting you to London um, in about 1920. The other thing she's doing is, um, which I thought was interesting, is uh, she's she's using an impersonal construction, so it's very passive. So it talks about, we're not seeing through anyone's eyes in particular. It was, not I thought it was, or my mum told me it was. The only thing that has an active role in this is the weather sending the clouds. And we have farmers, ladies, shoppers, businessmen, pigeons even. No one in particular, everyone in general. So this is the camera's eye, isn't it? The camera has no emotional interest in what it sees, so we've got distance. We're hovering above like a drone now, looking down. The camera doesn't care who does what, and it's a cinematic view. Now, interestingly, um, Virginia Woolf had things to say about the cinema. She wrote an essay called The Cinema in 1926, and she'd seen the 1920s German expressionist film The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And in this essay, The Cinema, which was published in the magazine, she said, we behold them as they are when we are not there. We see life as it is when we have no part in it. As we gaze, we seem to be removed from the pettiness of actual existence. The horse will not knock us down. The king will not grasp our hands. The wave will not wet our feet. Further, all this happened ten years ago, we are told. We are beholding a world which has gone beneath the waves. And that's what she's done there with that. Okay, that's all I want to say about that. I want to now look at the sentences themselves. It begins, it was an uncertain spring. So we've already said things about passivity. Let's not talk about that anymore. A short declarative sentence. So a really useful trick in writing is short sentence. You probably know this. Long sentence, long sentence, long sentence, short sentence. Hear the rhythm? Even when I'm saying it like that? The rhythm, okay? It was an uncertain spring. And another technique is that the last word, you can vary this, but if you have the last word of a short sentence as a monosyllable, spring it's, it's more like, a, think of drums, boom. It's a drum beat, spring, okay, boom. Now, if we use a, a stop, this is, mm, is a nasal, isn't it? So, g is a stop, but um, mm is a nasal. So, because it, it goes on, doesn't it? It doesn't stop. So, if we'd said it was an uncertain god, it was an uncertain dog, you know, it's more bangy, it's more percussive. But um, spring will do. So she brings that. And then she goes, a longer sentence. The weather perpetually changing sent clouds of blue and purple flying over the land. What she's actually saying there, the information she's conveying is, the weather sent clouds over the land. She says something about the colour. It's additional information. So that's the main clause, the weather sent clouds over the land. And now she adds information in it. And I call this an interrupted sentence because we have the main clause interrupted by sub-thoughts, which are often phrases. They can be clauses, but they're most often phrases in that. Um, yeah, a phrase doesn't tend to have a verb or a subject. A clause has a verb and a subject, a phrase doesn't. So the weather, which was perpetually changing, sent clouds, which were blue and purple and flew by over the land. You know, so it's the rhythm she's doing it for. You needn't say it like that. She needn't have said the whole thing. Uh, she could have said... Uh, the weather sent clouds over the land which flew by and were blue and purple. You know, so you could add all of that at the end, but she interrupts the main clause, and I think she does it for stylistic reasons, for, for the rhythm. Okay, so, um, and very long, complex, interrupted sentences were produced by such writers as Henry James and William Faulkner. In fact, people have criticised Faulkner's sentences as being almost uh, ununderstandable, incomprehensible, uh, but it was a very Victorian thing to do. Uh, you know the Victorians loved long words, they loved to show off their erudition by using obscure words and uh, throw in loads of words that nobody would understand and make their sentences extremely complex. It was almost like a, an intelligence test to understand them. And then of course Hemingway comes along and long sentences fall out of fashion. But the truth is short sentences and Hemingway type prose which you will get rammed down your throat by Grammarly and all these people telling you how you should write. Uh, it's just a fashion. So short sentences and simple prose is just as much a fat fashion. And Hemingway was great. It, it works. But also, there's nothing wrong with long, uh, complex sentences like this. And I think these interrupted sentences add a rippling, darting rhythm. And they work really well, as I said before, when you mix them with, you alternate them with short, simple sentences. Don't alternate them. Ideally, short, 
long, 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 short. That's better rather than. Oh, you can do short, short, long, short. You know, mix them up. See what it sounds like. So next sentence. In the country, farmers looking up at the fields were apprehensive. In London, umbrellas were opened and then shut by people looking at the sky. So we've got two sentences joined by a semicolon. You could have put a full stop, but the semicolon or a period, the full stop or the period is a harder stop. Think of crotchets and quavers um, that measure the length, that show the length of a note. These punctuations kind of intimate to you how hard you should stop if you're reading, you know? So in the country, comma, pause, little pause, looking at the fields, comma, were apprehensive, semicolon, longer pause, in London, umbrellas were open. You see, you could ideally, uh, I think uh, Grammarly would actually make you do, in the country, comma, farmers, comma, looking at the fields were apprehensive, in London, comma, because it wants um, adverbial phrases always to be, introductory adverbial phrases always want to, them to be followed by a comma. That's what Grammarly says. Uh, Virginia didn't bother, so I don't feel too uh, obliged to do what the uh, computer tells you. So, in London, umbrellas were opened and then shut by people looking up the sky. So, again, we've got... The main thought interrupted. So what we want to say is farmers were apprehensive. But we add extra information as sub-clauses or sub-phrases. In the country, farmers looking at the fields were apprehensive. So we've added extra information. And we could have said farmers were apprehensive looking at their fields in the country. But she interrupts for the rhythm. I'm sure it's for the rhythm, okay? This is just my opinion, but yeah, this is what I think. Uh, and also the other thing to say is if you have a, a sub-clause or a phrase, if it's an important piece of information, put that first. So in the country, farmers were apprehensive. So you could have done farmers were apprehensive in the country. In the, in the first, it's the country that's important, most important. In the second, it's farmers which are most important. Listen to that again. In the country, important. Farmers, it's where they were was important. Farmers were apprehensive in the country. So, uh, you know, farmers are usually found in the country, so you, you could probably say, well, you know, why, why even say that, really? So, um, and there's a parallelism, a parallelism, isn't there? In the country, farmers looking at the fields were apprehensive. In London, see, hear that? And hear that rhythm, that parallelism. It's, it's a musical device. She needn't have done it like that. I, can't, I know I keep saying that, but it's true. In the country, farmers in London, people. Right. If we were to write it out in a more fully parallel way, because it's not, because it's in the country clause, looking at in the country clause, farmers, which is a subject, looking at the fields, clause were apprehensive. In London, umbrellas were open. That is not the subject. People is a subject. So she's, she's, it's not completely parallel. If we were to write it completely in a parallel way, we might be in the country, farmers looking at the fields were apprehensive in the city, people looking at the sky, and ideally we should say were, were bothered or were unconcerned, and that would be a nice, uh, that's a chiasmus, I think, uh, and because we would reverse, you know, saying in the country farmers looking at the fields were apprehensive, in the city people looking at the sky weren't bothered. We probably wouldn't say weren't bothered because it's not very elegant, but you get the sense, and that is a proper parallel structure. Um, but, you know, mine is more parallel than hers. So oh, this always makes me laugh. Uh, I am not, I'm not saying that I am uh, I'm better than Virginia Woolf at writing sentences. I'm just kind of taking her sentences. I wonder how explicit she was when she was writing, whether she actually was thinking, right, yeah, I'm going to do parallel structure here. I'm going to do clause here. I'm going to do this. Or whether she did it purely by ear and uh, ended up with what she ended up with without adding any thought to it, any reflection to it. I don't know. She was a, a, a very accomplished writer, so either is possible. So, um, and I put but rather than and because I think but is, is it's the stop, the stop. So a vowel goes, ah, it's, it's continuant, but a stop has an ending to it, but, but, and, but. So there's a difference there, isn't there? Okay, and it slight, feels slightly heavier. So I'm going by my ear there as well. So, But in April, such weather was to be expected. So she's got the first one, uh, it was an uncertain spring, and then she's got these long, clausy, clausy sentences. But in April, such weather was to be expected. She brackets them there. And then she has another run of long sentences. Thousands of shop assistants made that remark. 
This is technically a cumulative sentence. So a cumulative sentence is one where we have the main clause at the beginning. Thousands of shop assistants made that remark. That's it. And then you add information in separate clauses. And so what we've got in a cumulative, cumulative sentence like this, thousands of shop assistants made that remark as they handed neat parcels. Oh, okay. Two ladies in flounced dresses. Or you could even do, as they handed neat parcels to ladies in flounced dresses standing at the other side of the counter at Whiteley's and the Army and Navy stores. So, And what you get there is that, boom, like a periodic sentence is where we put the verb at the very end. And that cre I'm, there isn't any here, but that creates that rhythm the other way around. Uh, Close, 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 mate. And you're straining for the main sentence. I'll do something on those. They're, they're really good as well. You don't want to overdo them because it can sound very uh, artificial. But um, if you overdo them, but now and again, they sound good. So, but this is a cumulative sentence, which is main clause, addition, 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 that has a rippling, echoing, trailing away uh, uh, rhythm to it, to me. Um and then we have another very complex sentence, interminable processions of shoppers, which is actually the subject. It's a nominative phrase, so it's all, all standing in for what we're saying is shoppers. You're just giving us more information, interminable processions of. Yeah? And then, so shoppers paraded the pavements is what we want to say. So shoppers and businessmen paraded the pavements. Shoppers in the West, businessmen in the East, paraded the pavements. In terminal processions of shoppers in the West End of businessmen in the East paraded the pavements. So what we're saying there's interminable processions of businessmen as well. So you see there's a parallelism there as well of shoppers in the West of businessmen in the East. It's not done by chance, it's deliberate. But there we have it, you know. Again, it's we're breaking up the main clause and it's just for rhythm. And she then adds like caravans perpetually marching and this next bit could actually be a new sentence but she joins it with a dash so so it seemed to those who had any reason to pause say to post a letter or at a club window in piccadilly it's rhythm it's rhythm so um, and we get a little alliteration as well so paraded the pavements paraded the pavements like caravans perpetually marching um Paro paroimia is when you do too much alliteration. It just sounds, again, too false and too forced. But, you know, here we are. We've got three Ps. And uh, like I say, the, the letters themselves are like um, notes. So it's like repeating a B or a D or a C-sharp minor. Um, and that is, it's for the ear. And, and you hear it. You hear it. You may not even um, know you've heard it, but you hear it. And it sounds pleasant. If we overdo it, like many things, like... Chili, for example, chili's nice. Overdo it, not pleasant. Okay, so um, so we're adding ideas. So I'm not going to go through the rest of them. You get the idea. It's all about the rhythm. So these, so in summary, what we're saying are you can have a simple declarative sentence if you wanted to make it short for rhythm reasons, and you want it, you can choose to end it with a bang, boom. Her last, actually, I didn't say, but um, she, she, it was an uncertain spring monosyllable but it, the, the next short sentence, sentence but in april such weather was to be expected expected a trisyllable and that has a different effect doesn't it spring boom finish close expected da, 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 da. it's just like a rattle going out it's all about the music man so um so i thought right if you're so clever i thought asking myself you do one you, you just so I basically looked at her sentence structure and I want to say something different I don't want to just copy it completely so I thought well um, I said to ChatGPT just change it and, it and it gave me something but it was rubbish so um, I uh, I ignored it and I did my own all right so this is me not ChatGPT it's not that smart let's go this is mine see what you think it sounds like I'm copying Virginia Woolf and this is what we can do. This is deliberate practice. We look at what the great people did and we copy it to try and make our own writing more greater. Yeah? I did that on purpose. The monsoon was expected. 
The rain clouds, vaguely gathering, promised the deluge of monumental proportions over both city and country alike. In their fields, farmers watching the sky were unsettled. In the city, businessmen remembered umbrellas and joked of rain. But in June, such rain is to be expected. Waiters said as much as they handed tiffin trays to office workers in linen suits waiting on the far side of the counter at the Irani cafes or from the counters of mobile market stalls. Heaving crowds of shoppers at Colaba Causeway, of sunbathers at Chowpati Beach, watched the sky like weathermen on a day off. So it seemed to those who had cause to pause, perhaps to post a card or glance in the window of a store at Bandra West. I think that's got the same effect. I'm sure that if you don't agree, you'll tell me. Uh, you know, we're just experimenting, we're just playing, so don't get too offended by things. Some people do get very offended by things on the internet, and it's not worth the trouble, really. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that.